Hi, this is Professor Stugard, and today we're going to go through a very interesting Stokes theorem example, which really demonstrates the value of how important Stokes theorem can actually be when it comes to evaluating some problems. So here's the problem. We want to use Stokes theorem to evaluate the surface integral of the curl of f dot ds, and we have our vector field given, and s consists of the top and the four sides, but not the bottom of the cube with vertices at plus and minus one oriented outward. All right, so this is actually from your textbook. This is from the Stokes theorem section number five. And let's make sure we actually understand the problem first. So my surface S, here it is. So again, it's a cube. Each of my vertices are all the different combinations of plus and minus one. Um, which means the origin is at the exact center and we are oriented outward. So again, the arrows are pointing out. Now, if I want to calculate this as a surface integral, well, what I'm actually gonna have to do is calculate, well, that front side and that side and that side and all four sides and the top. So I actually need to parameterize five separate surface integrals if I want to evaluate this problem. Oh, that sounds terrible. And again, I mean, the planes aren't that bad. The planes are x equals 1, y equals 1, x equals negative 1, y equals negative 1, and z equals 1, but that is still going to be a lot of work. Well, luckily, we have Stokes' theorem, and Stokes' theorem is, again, the, the whole point of this video. And so, again, we consider a surface that's oriented, and is bounded by a closed path C, well, then instead of having to calculate that surface integral of the curl of f dot ds, I can calculate my closed path line integral of just f dot dr. So, instead of looking at the surface, what I can consider is the boundary path. So again, it's got to be the boundary path. And so the boundary path is, well, that at the bottom. Again, we don't, we're not evaluating, our surface does not have the bottom of this cube, which means that part is open, which means, again, where uh, those kind of orange uh, arrows are, that is my, my path. That is my boundary path. My entire surface is enclosed by that boundary. And so I can do a line integral instead. Wait, except there's one, two, three, four different lines that I would need to parameterize to do my line integral. And again, like before, they're not the worst lines in the world to try to parameterize, but that sounds terrible. Huh. So again, instead of the surface, now I'm looking at the curve. So I don't even need the surface there. So here's my curve. So I need to evaluate this curve. And again, here's the genius that is Stokes' theorem, because Stokes' theorem says, if I have a closed path line integral of f dot dr, I can calculate this as a surface integral of curl of f dot ds. So instead of talking about the curve, now I need a surface. Well, what surface is enclosed by those four lines, or those four line segments? Well, it's a plane. Again, we need to make sure it's oriented. That's a big part of Stokes' theorem is, of course, knowing the orientation. And it's definitely oriented up. And so, um, again, check the arrows, right? We're moving around. Uh, with our orientation, you get that little guy walking. The inside of the surface is going to be on his left as he walks around the path in the direction of the arrows. Uh, and then his head would definitely be up. So it turns out my surface S is really just this plane Z equals negative one, bounded by uh, negative one less than or equal to X less than or equal to one, and negative one less than or equal to Y less than or equal to one. So this is my surface integral now, all right? And so oriented up, and while we have, while we're looking at our surface, we can make sure we understand this a little bit better, because again, that's also going to be my normal vector, right? My normal will be pointing up, especially since this is a plane, but again, it's going to be pointing directly up, which means my normal is actually going to also be my k hat vector. So that's the surface that I want to actually calculate for my surface integral. And again, that is the genius part of Stokes is that I had this surface that was gonna be terrible. So instead of considering the surface, which would have actually been five surface integrals, I considered the, the line integral for that closed path. Well, it turns out that was still four different 
line integrals. So then I went back and used Stokes' theorem again to come up with a new surface that is going to be much easier to evaluate. So again, we started with Stokes' theorem. Here's my problem. We have Stokes' theorem to evaluate that surface integral of the curl of f dot ds. We still have my vector field, but now this problem that was originally given as s consisting as the top and the four sides of this cube is identical to this. The surface s is the plane z equals negative one, bounded by, and again, like I said, negative one less than or equal to x less than or equal to one, and negative one less than or equal to y less than or equal to one. And so that is going to be a much, much easier surface integral to compute. And again, that is the genius of Stokes. We can take these terrible these terrible surfaces that might be incredibly difficult to do, consider their boundary curve, and then see if, while I consider that boundary curve, is there a better surface to actually go ahead and evaluate uh, this, this surface integral? Now, to actually evaluate the surface integral, again, we typically have the notation given right there on the left, but what that really means, that, that ds, where s is the vector, right? That's really saying I want the normal vector and then ds without the vector, um, which is just, again, the, the surface. So we're really going to be calculating the curl of f dot n and then uh, with respect to ds. But well, like I said, that, that we're going to make that substitution. That's That comes from how we set up our surface integrals. But from earlier, we knew that our surface S, which is that plane Z equals negative one, that the normal vector is actually just K hat. It's not even a function now. It's just literally going to be K hat. So what that means is that this expression here, what I'm actually going to be able to calculate now is the curl of F dot K hat DS. And we know that k hat is really the unit vector 0, 0, 1. And so the curl of f dot 0, 0, 1. Well, hold on. Let's slow down a little bit here first, because again, instead of calculating the entire curl, which I could do, I could absolutely calculate the entire curl, go through, find the entire, um, you know, set up the determinant, do my minor matrices, uh, calculate the entire curl. I'm not actually going to have to do that in this case because when I dot it with k well again my first component of k is zero so we multiply the corresponding components and add them together so zero times my first component well, zero times anything goes away my second component of k hat is zero so zero times the second component is zero it goes away and then one times my third component which means it's just that third component that entire expression the curl of f dot k is just the partial of q with respect to x minus the partial of p with respect to y. Now, hopefully, for some of you, that actually sounds a little familiar because we've seen that expression before. That's from Green's theorem. That expression, the partial of q with respect to x minus the partial of p with respect to y, that is Green's theorem. And it turns out, if you had read the extra material I had posted about the vector form of Green's theorem, this is kind of this is where it comes from. This is how we can derive Green's theorem. And again, the idea is that it turns out that Stokes' theorem is really just the generalization of Green's theorem from two dimensions into our third dimension. And again, that's the same idea where right, Stokes' theorem, we have this surface integral, but instead of evaluating the entire surface, we can evaluate just the boundary. And then we actually worked backwards here too. But again, it's that whole idea that the fundamental theorem of calculus, instead of evaluating everything in the middle, we can just focus on our boundaries. Okay, so this is where we're at now. We, we started with the curl of f dot ds. We're able to show that because my surface s was z equals one, so again, that's very unique to this problem. It's because my surface is just a plane, in this case, z equals negative one. Uh, my normal vector is really k hat, which means it's really going to be just evaluating this particular expression for my surface integral. All right, so again, I need that expression though. I need the partial of Q with respect to X minus the partial of P with respect to Y. Well, now we can actually look at that vector field we're given. Uh, so Q, that's the K hat component would be XY and the partial of XY with respect to X 
is just going to be y. It can hopefully partial our piece of cake now. And then similarly, I need p with respect to y. So p is my x, y, z. And when I take that partial with respect to y, I just end up with x, z. Therefore, that expression, the partial of q with respect to x minus the partial of p with respect to y is just the expression y minus x, z. But wait, we know that z equals negative one. That's my parameterization because that is my surface. So, well, I can replace z with negative one because again, that's, that's my entire surface. Z is negative one for my entire surface. That's the parameterization. So when I replace z with negative one, I get that my expression now is actually y plus x. So to recap, we have not done any actual calculus yet. There's been no real integrals. Um, we have done two partial derivatives, of course. But we started with this problem that was the, the surface integral of the curl of f dot ds. We know that the real way we're going to calculate that typically is going to be the curl of f dot n ds. We showed that n was really going to be k hat for this particular expression, which means I can use the Green's theorem formula. And we calculated that, and now it's just the expression y plus x. That is my surface integral. That's the part that I'm actually going to be integrating is y plus x. Now, since our surface z equals 1 is a function of that form, z equals, well, a function of x and y, right? I can isolate z. That means that ds is going to be that square root of g partial x squared plus g partial y squared plus 1 dA. And again, that's that Jacobian, that scaling factor from switching from ds to dA. But again, my function g is just negative one. It's a constant. Z equals negative one. It's a constant. So the partial with respect to X is zero. The partial with respect to Y is zero. And so zero squared is zero plus zero squared is zero plus one is just one. And the square root of one is one, which means DS equals DA. And again, that should start to make some intuitive sense if you understand what that Jacobian really means. Right? The Jacobian is how we scale from our normal rectangles DX, DY, into our new surface. But again, our surface is that flat plane z equals one. It's just a flat plane, uh, which would be the same x's and y's as if I was in my xy plane. So yes, my ds is going to equal dA. All right, so again, taking that next step, we know that it's dA and my integrand is y plus x. I just have to put that as x plus y, though, because that's alphabetical order. We know that x and y are bounded between negative 1 and 1 each. Uh, I can do this in either order because they are constants. I can do with respect to y first or with respect to x first. I'm going to choose to do with respect to y first because that's a type 1, and that just feels comfortable to me. But like I said, you could do it either way. And so integrating with respect to y, well, the antiderivative of x with respect to y is going to be xy. The antiderivative of y with respect to y is going to be 1 half y squared. We plug in our bounds negative 1 and 1. And again, I'm not going to do all this out, but absolutely write it down in your paper. Uh, you should write this out and do the work yourself. But I'm going to assume that if you're in Calc 3, we can evaluate uh, simple integrals at this point. Because it simplifies to just 2x, the antiderivative of 2x is x squared. We evaluate from negative 1 to 1, and we get 0. So the answer to this particular example is 0. All right. So again, the main idea here is that the, the, the key part is trying to understand these problems and understand what's going on. And you really need the conceptual knowledge to do well. The partial derivatives and the integrating part, those should be second nature at this point. We shouldn't be making mistakes there. We really want to understand what the problem's telling us. And I love problems like this, especially on exams, where if you understand what's going on, well, then the integration itself is really easy. The integration should be easy. It should be your understanding and your knowledge of the concepts and how we set these things up to make them work. And again, I think this is just in absolutely incredible example because we were able to start with a surface that would have needed five different parameterizations. 
We turned it into a curve, which needed four parameterizations, and then turned it back into a new surface with just one parameterization, which I think is just awesome. And if you don't think that's cool, man, rethink your your career choice because it doesn't get more fun than this. At least I don't think so. Anyway, good luck studying and let me know if you have any questions. Bye.